Hello, and welcome to this special episode of And So It Flows. I'm your host, Nicole Crocky, Chief Editor of Plumbing and Mechanical Magazine. Today's topic of discussion is all things Radiant, and we've convened an incredible panel of Radiant All-Stars to discuss current trends and the benefits of Radiant technology. With us today are Robert Bean, ASHRAE Fellow, Lecturer, and Retired Engineering Technology Practitioner, Mark Etherton, a retired hydronic heating contractor, educator, and columnist, and the former executive director of the Radiant Professionals Alliance, Dan Hallihan, founder of HeatingHelp.com and well-known industry educator and author, John Siegenthaler, consulting engineer and principal of Appropriate Designs in Holland Patent, New York, and last but certainly not least, Dave Yates, a former mechanical contractor and owner of F.W. Baylor in New York, Pennsylvania. Thank you all for being with us today. So jumping right into our questions, when it comes to heating, it seems as hydronics, it, you know, has been trending downward in the United States in favor of more traditional forced air, mini splits and heat pump systems. So do you guys still think there is a market for radiant and hydronics technology? What are you guys seeing in your respective areas? Absolutely. I would agree. Totally agree. <laughs> I, I think it's one of the best times to be in the market right now with, with heat pumps and the electrification trends. Um, heat pumps bring cooling to hydronics. That's a big deal. Yeah, there's no doubt about it that's <clears throat> that the trend with decarbonization and the move to electrification really supports going back to district energy and cogen systems and how radiant and hydronics in general enables the efficiencies and the effectiveness of those systems. So the timing is couldn't be any better. Well, in the advent of air to water heat pumps with inverter technology has only opened up the market even further. And for contractors who are a little bit savvy and willing to take some training on, I think this is a great opportunity for them to actually carve out a niche for themselves in this market and be able to present to their customers the wonderful comfort of radiant heating they can also do hydro air. The, these systems are incredibly flexible with the uh, ability to power up all kinds of comfort uh, delivery systems. And I, I just see great opportunities ahead for contractors who are willing to open their eyes and see this market for what it is. You know, Nicole, having been in this business for 50 years, I've seen more than my share of dips in the sales of uh, hydronic components and radiant heating systems. And it's it's really tied more to the economy than it is um, knowledge. Unfortunately, when things get tough and money gets tight, people start looking for the lesser expensive alternative. And unfortunately, forced air pops up as being the least expensive. And the biggest problem is that those people don't really understand comfort. If they understood comfort and efficiency, they would avoid the major use of air, which is very inefficient from the standpoint of the cost of moving the air itself and uh, fall back to the uh, comforts of hydronics. Uh, the company that I just recently retired from last June 11th is busier than they've ever been. And the uh, forecast is nothing but additional <laughs> business coming in. So it is a niche market. That's all they do is hydronics. They don't do any plumbing. And uh, they haven't seen a dip, quite honestly. They're seeing a, an increase in business. That's fantastic. Did anybody else want to add anything there? Well, I think on the on the comfort side, again, it's almost, I don't want to say impossible, but even when you look at the delivery of air, particularly with the heat pumps, um, there's no way that they can create the same environment at the low temperatures that we can with radiant. You know, when you get into high performance buildings where the design fluid temperature could easily get down to 80 degrees, 85 degree fluid temperatures, well, you can't send 80 degree fluid temperatures into a home at a, in a cooling climate or whether it's winter and mm -hmm. expect um, to be compliant with ASHRAE 55. Just the velocity alone with 85 will cool people, right? But with radiant, 85 is no problem, right? We Because we're controlling the radiant component as opposed to the air component. 
Well, that's what I did with my designs was to lean more towards the European method of designing for ultra low temperature radiant systems. Yeah. And during one of the comfort tank presentations, the keynote speaker indicated that for every three degrees, we can lower the water temperature. We increase system efficiency by 1%, which made, it was like somebody turned a light on in a dark room when he said that. And I went back and looked at three jobs that we had done for three engineers who closely tracked their energy usage before and after we installed the radiant systems. And that three to one ratio turned out to be pretty darn accurate. It wasn't spot on. And I had even contacted John Siegenthaler and asked him if anybody had done a study on this. And John said, no, but you know, it certainly would be interesting to do one. So my own study on it proved that this was in fact correct. And that explained the large difference that we saw between the operating, the stated operating efficiency between the conventional chimney vented appliance and the new ModCon boiler efficiencies were which were as high as 95 percent so we routinely saw a 30 percent to 50 percent reduction in energy consumption for our customers that switched over to radiant heating and had low temperature systems and like robert said most of our systems were well below 90 degrees fahrenheit as far as the water temperature in fact 83 to 85 was more the norm than anything else and perfect uh, perfectly comfortable for the people in the environment and you know the people that we installed these systems for swore by them they absolutely love them so once again you know that that three to one ratio worked out very well on paper with the three systems that have been accurately tracked by engineers that we worked for okay well since you brought up low temperature radiant are there any other benefits to designing for that and you know why is that important um, Nicole, it's really about heat source efficiency. Uh, just to you know, reiterate what Dave was saying, uh, whether it's a ModCon boiler or a heat pump, and it, it could be air to water, it could be water to water, um, for that matter, solar collectors, all those heat sources operate more efficiently at low water temperature. So the lower you can keep the water temperature, still deliver comfort in the space, the higher the efficiency the heat source is going to be. And so that's that's the physics of it, really. Okay. Yeah. And it goes back, I mean, in order to get, well, again, it depends on climate zone, but in order to get these low temperatures, it has to be an integrated design. You have to include the enclosure engineering as well. And, you know, a great example of that one of the last projects I did before I retired was a 100,000 square foot multi purpose industrial facility. And I was away uh, down in the south somewhere at some conference, and I had a call from the building operator and telling us that it was minus 40. Fahrenheit or Celsius, which is why they call it minus 40 F and cold, and because <laughs> it's the same number <laughs> at that range. And he was saying, you know, I know Robert, you designed the system that at design conditions we could, you know, use like 105 degree Fahrenheit supply temperatures, but we're perfectly fine in this facility. Nobody's complaining, so we want to drop the temperature down to 95 supply to see what happens. Well, nobody does that. Nobody, every, design conditions, everybody, in, particularly in air systems, everybody's cranking up their thermostat as if it makes a difference and uh, or cranking up their boilers. But when you have a high performance enclosure, you know, you just keep driving the temperature down as far as low as you can. And, you know, so it, it, it's, it's about, as John and Dave said, the mechanical system, but it, you also have to include the enclosure. And with the drive towards improving buildings, there's no better match. There will never be in our lifetime a better match than a high performance building uh, serviced by a heat pump connected to a large surface area heat exchangers. That will be as good as it gets in our lifetime. Okay. Now, radiant systems have numerous benefits. The first being superior comfort, which I know Mark and Dave, you guys just touched on. But something that's talked about less is some of the health benefits <laughs> of radiant. Um, can you guys elaborate on those? Sure. You know, um, it, I think it's necessary to move air in any conditioning system. And God bless Dan Hollihan. He raised me early to uh, basically realize that scorched air was our enemy. And as it pertains to base systems, they are. And as time went on, I think we both agree that it is absolutely necessary to move air in order to guarantee good, healthy comfort 
to the end consumers. And um, the, the amount of air that's necessary in a properly designed, properly installed, properly operated hydronic radiant system is minimal. And uh, most of the, the illnesses that we have to deal with are basically transported by air. Therefore, there is less potential of moving these problems throughout the house with a hydronic radiant heating system or a hydronic system in general, as opposed to a forced air system that has an inadequate filtration system that is basically moving everything throughout the envelope itself. And uh, there is a big difference. And you know, I used to do a lot of expert witness consulting and nobody could put a price on comfort. I had a number of lawyers that were able to put a price on discomfort, but comfort itself is virtually priceless. And until you've experienced it, it, it's really hard to equate. And those people that have experienced it through hydronics and through radiant refuse to deal with anything else. As time goes on and they change houses and they build a new house, hydronic radiant is a part of the package itself. And, and it has to do with higher efficiencies, um, better health. I mean, health has been a knowledgeable factor about hydronic, clear back to the days of steam. The people that were dealing with steam as their heat source, the, the elite, the rich people that were able to afford it were much healthier than a lot of the other people that were using other methods of being able to heat. So there are a lot of advantages. And I think as time goes on, we'll discover even more. There's some very practical applications as well. We had a customer with fibromyalgia, which apparently is very painful. And she wanted to have radiant heating because she had gone to a football game at Penn State and stayed with in the apartment that her son's friend owned that had radiant heat. And for the first time in her life, she was comfortable during the winter. So we did a house for them with 100% radiant heat. And for the very first time ever, she was able to stand at their large picture window and watch the falling snow bathed in pure comfort without pain. That's great. Yeah, I think it's important when it, when it comes to, you know, the human body, we have a separate respiratory system. We have a separate thermal comfort system. We don't mix them, although they're, they're tied into your brain. Standards are separate. We have a separate air quality standard, 62.2 for residential, 62.1 for commercial, and we have a separate thermal comfort standard, 55. And when you separate those systems, then those systems get to do what they're designed to do. And they do it better than trying to mix them, which is what happens with forced air systems. And so Mark makes a good point. You know, when you talk about air quality, a system that is designed specifically to deal with the qualities of the air, particulate humidity, temperature, these types of things, that it just does a great job and let the radiant do the thermal comfort component. And that reduces stress in the environment. People don't get tweaked out of shape because it's they're trying to live in an environment that's conditioned mm -hmm. by a system that's trying to do both things and doesn't do it very well. You know, and you think about, right, this is one thing that people don't understand. You think about all the buildings and in inventory in the continent where the thermostat turns the filtration system off because it's satisfied by a temperature. That doesn't happen when you have a dedicated ventilation system. The ventilation system runs 24 seven, cleaning the air all the time. But if you have a furnace or a heat, a heat pump that's air-based and if the thermostat shuts it off, well, you're no longer cleaning the air, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. Did anybody By the way, Dan's, Dan's not contributing to the conversation because he doesn't need to. He just needs to sit there and look wise and elderly. Oh, and no, no, brilliant. I'm just, I, you're my favorite. <laughs> You know, my favorite people, you know, that and I always, when I shut up, I learn more. But uh, <laughs> while I'm sitting here thinking about how uh, this has been a, a challenge for us since it's, I mean, since I've been in the business, is that there's, there's really no big voice in terms of an organization or or a group that, that speaks these truths to the public. And it's all being done by individuals, contractors and engineers. And, you know, you talk to this customer, convince them, he tells his friends. But this is why... Radiant, like uh, uh, steam air vents, is a profitable non-growth business. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's been about the same for the, you know, since 1970 when I got in. I mean, it was not radiant so much, but hydronics has been the same piece of the pie. And it is shrinking. And the message that's out there now is, of course, electrification, but not, in a, not tied to 
hydronics in the U.S. And I mean, I'm reading all about that being tied to hydronics in Europe. And you can see the movement of what's going on over there now with Wiesmann being sold, uh, the, the heat pump factories opening up by Bosch and Wiesmann in Poland. And they're just embracing all this and jumping at it. And at the same time, we've got uh, this, this contractor, uh, I'd say, I, don't, I wouldn't say the majority of contractors, but many, many contractors are vocally telling people that these things are no good. And, uh, and they're, you know, they're with the customers. I mean, let, last year, the, the U.S. government set out this, uh, this heat pump, low temperature heat pump challenge. And train answered, the, train answered the call and came up with something that works, you know, well, below 20, below zero. And when I talk to my contractor friends, they say to me, that's not true. I said, well, what's not true? Well, there are there, these things can't do that. I said, but they're doing it. They're, they're doing it in Scandinavia. They're doing it in Northern Maine. No, they're not. <laughs> and it, it kind of cuts in with the other things that are going on in our lives from day to day. I don't believe that. Well, what, <laughs> what are you basing your disbelief on? I just don't believe it. I don't want to know. It's threatening my, my career. This is not, in the, this is not a, you can't put a wrench on a heat pump. Yeah. It's taken away. That's electrician's work. I'm gonna, I, I don't want to talk about this stuff. If people ask me, I'm going to tell them it doesn't work. You're going to have to keep your old boiler. If you get rid of your old steam system, you're out of your mind. You know, none of this stuff is going to work. You'll see. I wouldn't put it in my house. And then the customer says, well, first of all, I don't understand what a heat pump is. Second of all, it's got a crazy name. You know, have you been watching the news about that lately? They're talking about that is a crazy name. It really doesn't say anything. And it came up, it says it needs a cooler name, something like a, <clears throat> something like a Heaty McPump face. You know, give it give it some some charm that people will look at it and say, uh, wow, that's new. I wonder what it is. But if you got you got uh, a shortage of contractors coming into the industry, shortage of technicians, I think manufacturers are going to be looking at that and saying, well, we're going to come up with systems that are that are simpler, you know. Um, Musk is looking at heat pumps now. Let's let's have something that uh, you know you got a box inside, a box outside, and some refrigeration lines going back and forth. That's going to give you heating and cooling. You're going to be really happy. It doesn't use gas. You know the government's against gas now. The municipalities are against gas. Uh, the planet's in trouble, um, and people say, okay, well, how much is that going to be? Oh, don't worry, we're going to give you some subsidies for that, so you'll be able to do. That's the trend, and and all this all this true stuff that we're saying to each other there's nobody out there saying that to the public train you know train comes up tra train was uh, predominant in vapor heating back in the day and and they actually invented the convector but but they didn't Ruben train didn't call it a convector he called it furniture and this was during the 30s and he took that convector that was made of copper because there was a shortage of iron at the time due to the buildup of war. And he took it around to every manufacturer of radiators and said, I want you to, I want you to consider this. This could be a good part of your line. And they all told him to, to, to get lost. You know, they, that's challenging our existing business. We don't want to have anything to do with that. So he says, okay, I'm going to make it myself. And that gives us the convector, which gives us a whole change in the business. And then he puts a fan inside of it a few years later, and he invents the fan coil. The radiator people weren't interested in that either. You know, but this is this is what I see at this age. It's a, you know, the, the coal people hated the oil people. The oil the oil people hated the gas people. The gas people are now hating the electric people. Nobody's talking about comfort except when we talk to our our own customers and each other. But there's no organization that does that. I, you know, 30 years ago, I said we should build two houses side by side and challenge the forced air industry to, you know, send out your best warriors, design a system, put it over here. The hydronics people will put their system over here, identical houses side by side. And then let's watch them for a couple of years. Let's bring the public in there and see where they're more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Like the American Radiator Company did at the St. Louis World's Fair so many years ago. Where they built this house and they said, come and feel what this feels like. And that's what put hydronics on the map. We don't do that anymore. Which is why Radiant, I think, is a profitable non-growth business. Okay. How'd I do? <laughs> that was good, Dan. Fantastic as always. You did that's, that's what happens when you ask me to, that's what that? happens when you ask me to ask me to talk, right? <laughs> Nicole, I got my come up it's many years ago when I went to my first RPA convention. And at that time it was the Radiant 
Panel Association. And the very first class I took was one of John Siegenthaler's. And I was, as Dan said, a stick in the mud contractor, very content with what I thought I knew about hydronics, doing the same thing I'd done day in, day out, year in and year out, no changes, didn't want any changes. And about five minutes into John's class, I thought, I don't know a damn thing about hydronics. (laughs) My choice was, you know, either stay stick in the mud. Go ahead, I Dan. share that feeling there. I, I share that <laughs> feeling. <laughs> well, I, you know, my choice was stay as a stick in the mud contractor, go back to York, Pennsylvania, keep doing what I'd been doing, which was certainly profitable, and ignore all the changes that were taking place in the industry, or buckle down and learn everything I could. It's also where I met Robert Bean and Mark Etherton and Dan Hollihan. Well, I'd already known Dan because Dan and I got to know each other through a, a different circumstance, but um, through the wall that he had. And then through some of his seminars, but I took every class I could from John Siegenthaler. I took every class I could from our good buddy, Robert Bean, who even had me pretend to be a woman during one of his (laughs) seminars, a very reluctant, radiant customer. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Certainly not today, but the long story (laughs) short, it's a constant learning process. And today you can get all this stuff online. You can get it from manufacturers. Uh, especially the circulator manufacturers who have long been leading this industry. And uh, and the opportunities that present themselves out there, they're there for the taking. Yeah. And I think that key is that, you know, like you said, you wanted, you, you said, or you can learn everything you can. And I think that's kind of where contractors nowadays, they need to take that initiative and learn all of this new technology, especially heat pumps or else they're going to miss, miss the bus for that opportunity. Um, so historically, moving on, I know one of the biggest barriers to radiant technology was the cooling part of the equation. And today there are tons of new technologies available to advance that radiant cooling market. Um, John, I know you've addressed this topic in many of your PM and PM engineer columns. Can you elaborate on that a little bit for our listeners? Yeah, yeah. Radiant cooling is is really based on the idea that If you look at a cooling load, there's two parts to it. There's what's called sensible cooling where you're bringing the air temperature down Mm -hmm. and there's latent cooling where you're removing moisture from the the air. And traditional systems, all air systems have to carry both loads and they have to carry enough air to handle both loads. And moving that air around, I know uh, Dave mentioned, it, it takes a lot more power to move a given quantity of cooling effect or heating with air compared to uh, water. So radiant cooling is based on shifting a large portion of the total cooling load, the sensible cooling load, or at least part of it, to water-based delivery rather than air-based delivery. And the savings or the incentive is lower distribution costs, less horsepower to move that cooling effect through the building. And it can be applied very well in commercial structures, especially where there's a lot of sensible heat gain. Think about an airport terminal is a good example where you've got skylights and windows, lots of glass, lots of solar gain, lots of people. Uh, Those are good applications for cooling. And it's been done all over the world in, in many types of commercial structures. Residentially, there are products out there right now but it's a tougher challenge in residential. Uh, control requirements are more costly, more complex. And I, I think right now that tends to be what's holding that market back. Uh, you cannot let that water get down below the dew point temperature of the air or you will make a mess in a hurry with condensation. So given the skills of residential contractors, especially some of the things we've been talking about here were, you know, they may not be open to the technology involved to do it successfully, a radiant cooling successfully in a residential project. I think that market will probably evolve some. Uh, I don't see radiant cooling in residential as a strong growth market. Uh, There's just the complications and the cost are what's going to hold it back at this point. But I definitely see it expanding in commercial 
markets where you've got a lot of, especially a lot of solar heat gain. John, well, I think that, oh, I'm sorry. John, yeah, I think the, only, when... the only comment I would want to add to, to John's statement there on, on the condensation part of this, and that is, is that if you 100% of all condensation problems and buildings conditioned exclusively with air did not have radiant cooling to blame. True. <laughs> you understand true. that? Yeah, right? So... so it's the problem is not so much the radiant cooling system it's the moisture in the air and we condition the air to prevent microbial growth we condition the air to prevent wood being damaged by changes in moisture we condition the moisture in the air um, to prevent issues with medical respiratory issues like there's lots of reasons why we control the moisture in the air independent of the heating and the cooling system and so I just want to make sure that the listeners understand that when it comes to radiant cooling and condensation, that we already in a properly engineered system control the moisture content, which allows us to use radiant cooling without condensing. And that again, going back to the problems there's, I can't, I would say in my entire career that for every a thousand can condensation mm -hmm. problems on air systems, maybe we've had one radiant problem. Like the numbers don't skew towards radiant condensation, it skews to the air side, always. So just wanted to make that clear. Okay. Dan, you had something to add. Yeah, I was, I was just, John, when you, uh, when we agree that, you know, it's it's not, radiant's not gonna be the best for cooling. If, if we say that, then, uh, you know, the contractor then says, uh, well, heat pump. You know, you get heating, cooling, cheaper, mm -hmm. easier, get it in for you next week. And I think the average consumer says, or residential anyway, is going to say, okay, you know, which brings us back to, uh, you know, a non-profitable, <laughs> uh, non-growth business at that point with residential. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I, I think another approach too is, you know, to do ventilation in the building. As buildings get tighter, we really need that ventilation and to create... <clears throat> an air handling system that handles both um, the ventilation load and to Robert's point with properly conditioned air. And, and Robert, you're probably talking about DOAS systems, right? Yeah. In commercial buildings Correct. where we, in a sense, we super dry the air before we inject it into space and we absorb the moisture that way. Uh, yeah. I, I totally agree. You know, proper engineering, you can do radiant cooling. It's, it's a matter of will the contractors rise to the occasion? Will they, uh, you know, will they design these systems properly? Uh, do you know, dew point control is part of it. Uh, proper ventilation is part of it. We may get there, uh, but okay. again, I think in the residential market, I, I would tell somebody that's doing hydronics today, just my own opinion. If you're if you're going to bring a heat pump into the picture and you're going to do cooling, you can do it with an air handler, or you can do it with multiple console type air handlers that, that have drip pans in them, but that's more forgiving, at least initially, than jumping immediately into a radiant cooling application. Uh, again, it, it from what I've seen over the years, it takes this industry years to accept and understand and properly apply a new concept. Think about primary, secondary piping. When that came in, it, it took a while for that to take hold. Uh, yeah. Hydraulic separation, uh, injection mixing. I mean, there's a lot of technologies. And, and I think most of us here, we're probably pretty close to the cutting edge in adopting those technologies. And there probably are similar people that will look at radiant cooling and, and be kind of the first ones out there to really do it and do it properly in uh, smaller structures. Uh, but it's gonna take proof of concept from those initial people to convince the, I don't want to do this crowd that it, it can be done. And, and I think manufacturers have to kind of rise to the occasion too, to make, make it a plug and play system. That that's always been one of the drawbacks with, with hydronics is that, you know, if you think about it, if you take a, a hydronic system in a building, a, a house, and you just took all those parts and just laid them out on a, like a gymnasium floor 
and counted every wire nut, every fitting, every <laughs> screw that went in there. You've got thousands of pieces. And what other industry takes thousands of pieces out to a construction site, you know, short of building the structure itself and, and tries to assemble that system? We we've made or we we haven't had the appliance concept applied enough in our hydronics market. And to, to get something like radiant cooling to be successfully deployed, there's going to be some handholding required. And, and I, I think the manufacturers would really have to rise to that occasion and, and bring out systems that are pretty close to the plug and play. To, and to John, if there, were, if there were 100 contractors that showed up that morning and looked at that pile of stuff, how many different ways would there be to assemble it? Yeah, 100. <laughs> and no, so probably 100, actually, probably, probably 120. 120. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just say some would some would change their minds along the way. They would <laughs> multiple times. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Staying out of Robin, you, you, see if it works. You, Robin, you've long talked about survival models. That's one of the things that stayed with me mostly over the years. So, you know, we know what a refrigerator looks like. We know what a fire extinguisher looks like. What does a what does a hydronic system look like? Yeah, there. And this there goes back this... to the boiler in the box. Remember, and and you know, here you go. This is. Plug and play, and it and that that was a brilliant, brilliant concept, and it went nowhere. Yeah, yeah, we have no survival form for hydronics yet. You know, yeah. and it's because of what John just said. Like you take uh, you take a gymnasium floor full of parts and a hundred contractors, like you said, show up, and you'll have more than a hundred <laughs> ways to, to assemble it. Well, and they'll, they'll fight. They'll fight with each other. And they'll <laughs> exactly. And yeah. no, they won't even get started. They'll be fighting. Yeah, and according to the hundred of them, only one of them will be right. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think nobody's it's gonna important. Up, nobody, nobody's going to open up the installation manual. <laughs> I think it's important sorry, to point Mark. out that <laughs> our industry has spent literally millions, possibly billions of dollars promoting the comfort of radiant floor heating, which absolutely is the most comfortable method of delivering heat because you're standing on the actual heat emitter itself. But our industry has lost sight of other surfaces. And one of the problems that we ran into in trying to introduce radiant cooling on a residential scale was that the people were not allowed to have hardwood floors. They were not allowed to have any kind of a carpet or a pad because that will trap cool, which will then promote a cooler surface, which could conceivably condense moisture. And it, it's just an issue. People want their rugs. They want hardwood floors. They like warm floors. I think if if our industry opens its eyes to the other mm -hmm. surfaces, radiant walls, radiant ceilings, they will find surfaces that can, number one, be taken to a temperature that is cooler than what you would typically allow for a four surface contact situation where the humans are in contact with it and deliver excellent comfort. Robert had originally mentioned the efficiency of the envelope itself. I've had a couple of super insulated homes that were built to passive standards that didn't have any load. They actually had more of a cooling load. It was necessary to cool those buildings even in the middle of the winter months. And if you do that through a radiant ceiling or through a radiant wall, if the people want radiant floors, they can have it, but you have to control their expectations. If the load is five BTUs per square foot per hour, their floor is not going to be quote unquote warm to the touch. And if you manage their expectations and tell them they will be more comfortable than any other system in the world, then you can eliminate the need for radiant floors, go with radiant ceilings, which can provide cooling and heating if necessary, and deliver the comforts efficiently with hydronics. And, you know, it's just our industry is so stuck on radiant floors that they refuse to look at the other surfaces that are available. I know John's done radiant walls. I've done radiant walls. I've done radiant ceilings not only for my own residences, but also for customers. And not one complaint of anybody about, and I really don't like that as well as I like the radiant floors. It delivers, it delivers, it adjusts the mean radiant temperature, it manipulates it, it keeps the people comfortable. You can do cooling with a radiant ceiling without having to worry about any rugs or carpets or floor finish. If they want bare rugs on the floor, they can put them down. If they want hardwood floor, they can have it. Um, and when you start telling people that you have to limit their floors to a cementitious material, you're going to get a lot of people curling their nose going, maybe radiant cooling's not for me. Yeah, yeah I think the, the other surfaces are, are really one of the unsung heroes 
you know, we've participated in being the judges of these uh, contests that are put on by different associations over the years. John, I know you and I have done a few together. And uh, when I look at the complexity of the control systems that are there because they have multiple temperatures, well, a lot of that diversity in temperatures can be resolved by increasing surface area and, re and reducing the temperature of the system down to one temperature, just simply by increasing surface area. And that simplifies the systems, it, you know, for the life of the for the life of the building, right? And uh, so, yeah, Mark, I mean, it's a good point, and not just as a standalone system, but as a way of simplifying the control systems. And I will say that the one place that radiant floors are absolutely necessary is in the bathroom. That's where you're least clothed. You're probably wet. Um, it makes sense there, but for the rest of the house, for my money. It can be radiant ceilings and radiant walls, and you can do it for less money because you're not having to put one linear foot of pipe per square foot so that the customer experiences warm floors. And again, as you get into these super insulated homes, you have to control their expectations and let them know not to expect that floor to even be conceivably warm until you start approaching design conditions outside. And I think a lot of contractors need to start looking more to their manufacturers. And every manufacturer that I know as a program available for being able to do these alternative surfaces. It's just that people are so addicted to warm comfort floors that they don't look outside of that envelope and go, wow, there's a lot of other surfaces that I could do for less money and deliver the same good radiant comfort. Plus you can mix in flat panel radiators to supplement the heating or the cooling in the various rooms. So you can flatten out like Robert was talking about, you can flatten out that difference between various rooms and end up with just one continuous temperature. Yeah. Yeah. We... Or you can do like Dan Hollihan did to me at the Beesman School of Technology. And he got me to ask the instructor, why did we have to have thermostatic radiator valves on all the flat panel radiators throughout an entire building? And I think Dan knew this ahead of time. The instructor looked at me like I was the stupidest idiot that had ever asked a question in any of his classes and said, well, as the sun rises in the east, the rooms on that side of the building won't need heat. So those thermostatic radiator valves turn off, but the rooms in the west side of the building still need heat until the sun rises and comes over to that side of the building. And then the east side turns on, the west side turns off. And he looked at me and he said, do you understand now? Thanks for asking that, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, you seem to have a legacy of people getting you to do things. <laughs> it's a terrible burden. It's a terrible burden, Robert. So moving he, he's on. A good, he's a good wingman. <laughs> he is a great wingman. Moving on. One of the advantages of radiant hydronic systems is their versatility. They're great in both residential and commercial applications, and even in some applications that our listeners may not even be aware of. Dave, I know you've had um, quite a few unusual radiant applications. Can you share a few of those projects and why radiant was the best choice there? I have to say one of the most unusual jobs that we did was for Northern pre-stress products. They make pre-stress concrete beams for bridges and highways and some of these things are over well over 100 feet long and the aggregate that goes into the concrete mix and the concrete itself has to be heated up to about 110 degrees otherwise the aggregate if it goes in cold takes away the heat from the concrete and they can't secure government contract work if they can't keep that under control their prior method was to use coal-fired steam boilers and perforated steel piping that they ran on the floors and then they would they would simply dump the aggregate on top of that and the steam would heat up the aggregate aggregate and they take a front end loader in there and pick that up run very quickly to the other end of the factory where it would go into a mixing room and other ingredients would get mixed in with it it was not very accurate so they built a concrete bunker with a three foot thick concrete floor and concrete pre-stressed beams that weighed 20 tons a piece, that they built this thing two levels. The top part had three bunkers that they put different types of aggregate in and with automatic hoppers that would drop 
preheated material down into a preheated bunker with a conveyor belt. And they would it would dump in whatever mix that they needed with the aggregate, and then it would go to a mixing area and then very quickly go to the forms where they were pouring the molds. We uh, made up uh, radiant panels on six by six wire that were gonna go into these concrete beams. The interesting part was we could not go in the plant itself to place these, to place our panels because it was a union uh, controlled operation. We were non-union, so the union guy said, no, you can't come in here. So we had to make up all these panels ahead of time based on a drawing that Upanor had prepared and then supply that with instructions for the union guys to put in. They did manage to screw a couple of them up, so a couple of 20-ton beams got thrown away. But the interesting thing was, as these beams stacked one on top of the other, we had a six-inch window to connect all these tubes that were six inches apart for each of these panels that were in the concrete beams. And we couldn't be in the room itself when the beams were being set, so we had to come in afterwards and connect these tubes inside, and then they got buried, they got covered over with more concrete. Uh, that was probably one of the most unusual applications that we ever encountered. Mark Etherton wrote a, a column about it. Um, there was another one that dealt with, somebody was talking, I think, Mark, you were talking about naked and wet in the bathroom. We had an application down very close to the Pentagon in a neighborhood where the homes were well over $5 million each. And they were within spitting distance of each other. It was kind of crazy. But at any rate, 95-year-old woman confined to a wheelchair. She's got a full-time cook, a full-time maid, and a couple other house um, employees. And they contacted me about their radiant system was not working properly, that she couldn't get the master suite up over 55 degrees in bitter cold weather. Now, they were working with ground source heat pumps. And she had warm board. And the wonderful thing about warm board is they, they give you a detailed chart where you can plot how many BTUs you're going to get per square foot in the floor. And when we matched up the contractor's manual J heat loss calculation to warm board's um, calculations, it was painfully obvious that there was not enough heat in those floors to bring the temperature up in the space. And she had even told the contractor at one point, hire whoever you need to hire, I'll pay for it. <laughs> Where do you get customers like this? <laughs> and they're willing to pay for your mistakes because I never had that experience. But long story short, well, yeah, flat panel radiators were the ideal solution to resolve her comfort issues. And the wonderful part about flat panel radiators, you can size them to work with whatever water temperature you have to make up that shortfall and BTUs. And that resolved all of our comfort issues. So there's opportunities out there as long as you can do the homework and know what needs to be done to fix the application. Uh, unusual jobs like that are uh, they're a walk in the park. Did anybody else have any examples of those to share? I've, I've got a couple, but I just going back to Dave's comment, I think it's really important that people understand that when we do comfort heating, what we're trying to do is actually enable people to retain their own body heat. We're not trying to heat them up. We're trying to get them to retain their own body heat. And so by adding those radiators, what Dave did was he created the warm surfaces, which didn't extract energy from the, the lady in the wheelchair. She was able to keep her own heat. And that it was her keeping her own heat that provided the comfort that she was experiencing. I think that's really important. Um, We've done a, yeah some cool stuff, similar to what Dave, in terms of up here in the province of Alberta, contaminated soil needs to get treated. And so we would build similar bunkers that Dave did, and they would dump this contaminated soil to thaw it so that they could treat it. That was one. One of the ones that we did quite frequently was actually drying rooms. Instead of using dryers, uh, we would create these heated closets. And these were large closets. These were active families. They had lots of wet gear, snowmobile gear, skiing gear, swimsuits, whatever. And so we just had these large closets that were heated, radiant walls, radiant floors. And then we just put in a separate uh, air to air heat exchanger. And that's what provided the, the dehumidification load was to get rid of the moisture that way. So that was, I mean, I've got other ones, but that, those are two that would stick to my mind. 
That's really yeah. neat. I like that that drying thing. I think I need that in my own home. <laughs> well, for towels too, right? I mean, you we've done closets, you know, like towel closets. We've heated them. And every, if anybody spent any time in a hospital, the only nice thing about being in a hospital is the warm blankets that they bring you. That's the only nice thing. And well, you can you can do that for your clients. And there's a psychological reason behind that too, Robert. I, I, I went through surgery for removal of uh, my thyroid and she gave me a warm towel and she said they found studies that people that wake up with a warm towel have a higher percentage of quick and better recovery than those that don't. So there is a physical psychological value to that. Um, wow. That's why I got a warm towel in my bathroom. Of course, that my wife reading an article that said, you forgot yeah. to give us a towel warmer. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole, a, a very interesting application that I had that had pertained to hydronics. We did a 25,000 square foot freezer. It was a drive-in freezer for a uh, major grocery producer here in Denver. And one of the problems that you have when you're maintaining 25 below zero in a freezer is that cold travels down. If there's any moisture, it freezes, and when it freezes, it expands, and if it expands, it will cause the floor to warp. So there's frost control systems that they utilize. We basically put our tubing in at about 16 inches on center. It was three-quarter inch. There was no insulation. The There was insulation above it. There was six inches of XPS insulation between the heating source to control the frost balls and the actual concrete surface that the forklifts, forklifts drove on. And essentially what they were using for heat source was the cooling system that was maintaining the building at 25 below zero. So they extract heat out of that space and they put it into the soil beneath the space to control the formation of frost. And uh, there's companies that go around the country doing that on a regular basis. They uh, actually wanted to use this other company, but they weren't licensed in Denver. So they had to hire us to do the work for them. And I have a friend that works down there, and he says it works flawlessly. They've had no issues other than one pump failure, which is a wear item. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's a unique application and basically thermal energy transfer that most people don't think about. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Dennis uh, Dennis Belanti, who uh, most of us know, is uh, he's with Ferguson out of, out of Denver. And uh, he recently told me that they, they put a radiant cooling system into a track but just like a drag racing track, but just at the, at the start of it, because the sun was making the uh, the surface so hot that the tires couldn't grip on it. So they they cooled the first hundred feet or so of the track. And I said to him, "How do you size that?" He says, "We didn't." <laughs> <laughs> he says, "We just put in as much tubing as we possibly could and got the biggest chiller we could find, and we just ran it whenever they were having a races." <laughs> yeah. One way to do it, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but it worked. The yeah. drivers were very happy. So the racetrack is five miles west of me, and the people that come up here to race a mile above sea level love that track because it's got a lot of sticking to it. Yeah, there you go. So moving on again, um, as Dan touched on earlier, you know one of the big buzzwords right now in our industry is decarbonization or electrification. Um, the state governments are enacting natural gas bans to, and to move towards that future. Um, where do you see the radiant market fitting in with this electrification trend? Air to water heat pumps. Yeah, yeah the, whole, the whole shift is moving away from high temperature to low temperature and without getting into a technical discussion here around exergy, um, you know, when you think about the combustion temperature of natural gas at uh, 1700 degrees C, which is around 3200 degrees Fahrenheit, relative to the low temperature needs of a heating system for conditioning people, that's, those are, those are non-industrial grade temperatures, but combustion is industrial grade temperatures. So we can't keep using industrial grade energy and, and temperatures for non-industrial purposes. And that's really what decarbonization is all about. At the very, at, you know, the ethos of that is let's stop doing stupid things. And it's stupid to use industrial grade temperatures for non-industrial purposes. Mm -hmm. And so moving towards the electrical systems to run heat pumps, which run at a lower temperature relative to <clears throat> the boilers 
Uh, and but again, it goes back to what John was saying and Mark and and Dan. It's it's all it is an integrated system. You know, we're, we're driving for high performance buildings that lowers the temperatures. If we can lower the design temperatures, we can use the heat pumps and using the heat pumps connected to large surface area heat exchangers like panel radiators or radiant. It's a perfect marriage. And from an extra G perspective, that will be the best it will ever get. And so radiant hydronics in general enables the decarbonization at a really high effective rate that you can't get with other systems. And from a, no, contractor's, no, pers from a contractor's perspective, don't fight them, join them. Yeah, this absolutely. Is what the push is going to be <laughs> learn about the tax credits and incentives that are offered by utilities and any local credits or incentives that are available and go for it. You know, and yeah, learn that's how great. to do low temperature systems because the lower the operating temperature, the higher the efficiency operation for the air to water heat pump. And yeah, you know, that's today, terrific too, advice. Uh, you've got a lot of advocates uh, in the electrical side of the industry now. You've got utility people and not only heat pumps, but uh, rate structures within utilities, off peak rates, time of use rates, real time pricing, and hydronics with heat pumps and, and with thermal storage. And, and there's uh, different work going on in that area right now. Water is a really good material for thermal storage, but there's also phase change materials. And I know there's work going on looking at actually downsizing heat pumps, running them on off-peak rates and using some type of phase change material as a thermal storage battery, if you will. So you've got utility people that understand that need to shift that load around to balance their infrastructure. And hydronics, again, you've got the fundamental elements through design to, to do that very creatively. You, you really can't do that with, with air-based systems or, for that matter, with refrigerant-based systems. So uh, I think water and its characteristics enables some pretty creative design that cooperates or enhances what the utility companies are trying to do. Uh, and you've also got people, the word, the word's heat pump, I know it's, it's not a very sexy name, but when you do say heat pump in terms of uh, utility planners, uh, even even politicians, you know, you get their interest. And that may be the opening line to get them to see beyond just the heat pump itself to the system and uh, integrating hydronics, integrating, uh, you know, proper and to put together some really good, uh, really good projects. Dan, yeah, I, I think it's important. I mean, John, you and I were just at um, the Building Knowledge Conference in Ontario, and I think there was something like 250 people, uh, builders, contractors. These weren't mechanic. By and large, probably 90% of them weren't mechanical contractors, right. but they were incredibly receptive to the messaging that we brought to that conference. So there is a desire to learn, um, and as John's pointed out, the utilities are, are an ally and Dave, your comment is bang on, like you jump on board because this isn't gonna stop. Um, but I have a question actually for everybody online. And that is, is that if I think back and Mark, you would you probably agree with this um, over the years when governments got involved in subsidizing programs, equipment or systems uh, where the trades weren't prepared to respond I don't know any time in my career where I've seen the potential for a huge train wreck here going on. Yeah, it's it kind so of takes much... back to the that? old days of solar thermal when everybody became an expert overnight. And the next thing you know, they were selling oversized systems, pushing a 70% tax credit mm -hmm. on systems that should never have been installed, uh, grossly oversized. And, and the worst thing you can do with a solar system, solar thermal, is to oversize it and not utilize what it can produce, it will tear itself apart. And I unfortunately see the same direction coming up here real soon of unqualified people going, yeah, we can do that. And they'll get out there and screw it up, but it makes business for the service industry. I mean, probably a third of the business that advanced hydronics had was going out and repairing systems that other people had attempted to install. So I think you can expect it. Um, one thing I would like to note is that 
the use of hydronics to transfer energy from point A to point B is without a doubt the most efficient method. And it's just a matter of time before the government agencies, the DOEs of the world realize that and they start specifying that as a part of the requirement. They know, but they're following the path of least resistance. And I think that as time goes on and the consumer becomes more wary through education, that they're gonna go, yeah, hydronics is a way to go. If you wanna reduce your carbon footprint, including parasitic cost of operation, then you will look to hydronics. Yes, it's necessary to move air, but the amount of air that's necessary to be moved is minuscule as a portion of the load as a whole. And uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that the government agencies will pick up on this and go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. We, we need to start promoting this technology. Yeah, there's no doubt. Like if you think about um, the amount of refrigerant, like if we if we follow this to conclusion, right? If if everything went in was a was a heat pump and it was all refrigerant lines, no hydronics. Just can you imagine the amount of refrigerant that's inside buildings, which is completely opposite to what governments want? They want a reduction of refrigerant use. So we have a conflict being built within the industry right now, and the solution to keep refrigerant out of buildings from just purely a safety point of view. An environmental point of view is is hydronics. We don't need refrigerant lines running everywhere. We can use water, which is a way safer material than yeah. than refrigerants. Dan, I know yeah, you're. I'm, I'm assisting a company right now in the development of a training manual for installation and operation of a gas assisted heat pump that's 140 percent efficient that utilizes ammonia as its refrigerant. And it's, it's outside of the normal box of thinking. It is absolutely hydronics. It is self-contained. The ammonia is outside with the actual gas-fired heat pump itself. And um, you know, I, I think we're going to see more of this. I, I think the idea of being able to completely eliminate gas is way off in the future. That's not going to happen in the next 20, 30, or 40 years. We are too dependent upon it. Our grid cannot handle immediate electrification. And we're going to need to utilize what resources we have to a higher degree, including conservation, waste heat recovery, drain waste heat recovery. I mean, these things can reduce our energy consumption significantly. It's just a matter of education and application. Dan, you want to go ahead? Me? Yes. Oh, uh, I, I agree with all of this. Uh, I also wonder, I mean, you guys are the sharpest people I know, and, and uh, most of us are retired. <laughs> who's following up? John, who's going to replace you? <laughs> Not sure at this point. <laughs> His son. <laughs> oh, he's teaching mathematics now. I think that's his first love, really. Mm -hmm. he, he was good at doing tubing layouts, too, but didn't have the passion for uh, for hydronics. Yeah. Um, but there there are some younger people coming up through the ranks. Uh, I probably shouldn't mention names, but people in their 30s and their 40s that, that I, I think are uh, definitely, they do have the passion for this. And um, hopefully they will uh, pick up kind of where we're leaving off. Well, I hope so, because we put a lot of time into this, all of us. And, and uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, how many people have we taught? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, and I, I hope this I hope there's a new young vibrant group that has the enthusiasm that we have had in our careers to uh, to tell this story. It's so important. Somebody's gotta tell it. There's there's no there's no place you could drive to the hydronics industry in this world. <laughs> yeah, and our the listeners need to understand. I mean, collectively our our outreach isn't been confined to North America. I mean, it's all over the world. The yeah. publications that Dan, that you've written, and John, that you've written, you know, is is everywhere. It's it's there isn't a country that isn't isn't knowledgeable because uh, it's been due to your to your efforts. And yeah, well, you know, I'm a little concerned about about uh, artificial intelligence and ser and search versus research nowadays. With you know, with this next group. Uh, I've often had people say to me, um, 
I don't want to read the whole book. I just want to know the answer to this one problem. Mm -hmm. So well, you're not going to learn how to think properly, critically, intelligently to be able to see something that's just not on that screen. That's my concern too. Yeah, it's a valid concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's interesting with the newer technologies too, heat pumps. Uh, we did a lot of work uh, over the last few years with NYSERDA with uh, poured wood gasification boilers, pellet boilers. And oftentimes people will blame that new heat source if something isn't just right in terms of comfort. And usually it's not the heat source. Usually it's an in a, you know a improperly sized circulator, you know, hydronics 101. The mistakes are made in mm -hmm. hydronics 101 as opposed to, you know, is the heat pump big enough or is the heat pump operating yeah. correctly? So uh, going back to those fundamentals, anybody doing this, if you know, if you don't know how to use a pump curve, it's probably as a good example. You, you really shouldn't be designing systems if you don't have some understanding of, of what that device does. And, you know, we, we've over the years talking about training programs remember talking to a group up in Maine, not to pick on Maine too much, but I asked them, how do you size the uh, circulator in a primary loop? And the guy said, big house, I've got a big circulator on the left side of the truck. If it's a small house, I've got a small circulator on the right side of the truck. <laughs> you know, and that, it sounds funny, but he's telling me the truth. <laughs> he's just picking a pump based on, you know, kind of eyeballing the house and thinking, that's yeah. big enough. You know, same thing happens with uh, boilers. I know, Dan, you've talked about it too. Uh, what is it? Three-story house, three-section boiler or something like that? <laughs> yeah, you hold up your fingers across there the you street. Go. You know, there there you yeah. Well, one fellow in Staten Island told me that he looks, he, he combines the uh, the boiler manufacturer's catalog with the Ethan Allen furniture catalog. He walks in, if he sees really expensive furniture, they're getting a six-section boiler. <laughs> <laughs> I said, why? He says, because they could afford it. <laughs> well, well, John, as we found out during our trip over to Germany, um, it's not just the North American continent that is having issues with circulator sizing. Uh, the, the general rule of thumb is if a little pump does a little good, then a lot of pump will do a lot of good. And it ends up creating noise problems that that particular manufacturer spent a lot of money trying to reverse and get it straightened out to the point where the proper circulator for the proper application is the only correct answer. And our job of education will never end, I guarantee you. Well, you know, I, I'd like to think with the renewable sources that are coming in the market now, heat pumps and, and so forth, high efficiency, high efficiency boilers, it, it, the hydronics technology is really the glue that holds us, the, most of those thermal renewable systems together. And if you don't do the fundamentals right, I don't care how efficient the boiler claims to be or how high the COP on the heat pump is. In, in theory, you just won't achieve that performance without getting that, that foundation, that hydronics foundation done correctly. That's what I call the slipping clutch syndrome. You can have the best motor in the world and the best wheels <laughs> on the ground, but if the connection between the two of them is not good, you get nothing. Mm -hmm. Part of that is, you know, the bigger issue of how we categorize and characterize um, people in the industry. And somehow we've let pipe fitters and sheet metal workers call themselves designers. And they're not designers, they're pipe fitters. And there's a big difference between designing systems and fitting systems. And I think that's, you know, very important. And the same thing, you know, applies when you call somebody a carpenter, well, a carpenter can be a cribber, they can be a cabinet maker, they can be a framer. Uh, and when we talk to people and they say, well, we're gonna get a plumber to do our hydronic system. Well, those are two completely different trades. So we have a bigger issue, we have a bigger issue, I think in the industry and that is, is that uh, we let people call themselves designers when they're not. And when we ask people to do hydronic systems, they search for plumbers and they're not, they're completely different practices all of them important but the wrong people for the wrong jobs 
Now, we haven't touched on snowmelt systems at all yet, um, but I know that those can also come into play when you're talking about sustainability and energy efficiency. And Mark, you made a really good point to me over email that, you know, snowmelt systems can be set up to extract heat. So can you touch on that a little bit and why that's beneficial? Yeah, I would be glad to. Um, <clears throat> back in the day when I was the executive director of the Radiant Professionals Alliance, was at a code hearing and was sitting next to a young lady that was taking all kinds of interesting notes and started a con conversation with her only to find out that she was with the Environmental Defense Fund and that her sole purpose for being at this meeting was to ask for the elimination of snowmelt systems because it was an egregious waste of energy. And I said, let me ask you something. I said, if I could prove to you that I could produce more energy from a snowmelt system than the snowmelt system consumes in the process of melting snow, would that change your attitude? And she said, please explain more. And I said, we have technology available in the way of water source heat pumps. Uh, snowmelt system essentially represents a large unglazed solar collector, which is extremely efficient. And if we have a heat pump that has a coefficient of performance of three to one, which is basically 300%, and we have a matched load for demand, then essentially when that snowmelt system is not melting snow, it's absorbing energy, not just direct solar gain radiation, but also ambient energy. And that energy can be extracted and placed into another area where it can be used. Uh, here in Colorado, we have two authorities having jurisdiction. One is in uh, Carbon County, which is Aspen. The other is in Boulder, Colorado, Boulder County. And they both have a requirement. If you want to install a snowmelt system, you have to match the square footage of that snowmelt system with an active solar system. They don't specify whether it has to be solar PV or whether it has to be solar thermal. It just has to match in square footage of area. So we approached the people at the city of, of Boulder and said, listen, we need to put the snowmelt system into this parking garage, which is a huge surface area. There's not enough rooftop available for us to be able to place an active solar system to satisfy this. Would you be willing to accept this system as a solar absorber with a water source heat pump that we would then use to heat their swimming pool, their hot tub, and their clubhouse. And they said, yes, absolutely. It works, it's technology, it's available off shelf. And uh, we proceeded forward with it without having to clear up the roof with a whole lot of solar collectors. So it is a viable answer. It is uh, off shelf technology. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's something that can be done for anybody. I had, when I was the ED for the RPA, we had one person that actually painted his driveway, he stained his concrete black. He didn't even need a heat pump. He essentially had 120 degree Fahrenheit water available in that slab that he could use through a heat exchanger, through a reverse indirect, and essentially provide preheat for the domestic hot water heating for his whole family. Uh, I have no idea what the end result was as far as his reduction in energy consumption was concerned, but based on my own experience, I'm sure it was pretty substantial. Mark, did you change her mind? Change whose mind? The lady that asked you to tell her more. Yeah, as a matter of fact, she got up and walked out. <laughs> <laughs> she was done. It worked. That's great. Thank you. Nobody thinks that the <clears throat> idle flux off a of snowmelt system is equivalent to the cooling load in some of these high rises. And I was sitting in Vancouver looking at some of the high rise buildings there, and I'm just doing some mental math about the cooling load and then converting that into a snow melting load and the cooling loads in buildings in cities all over the world makes the snow melting loads look like belly button lint. <laughs> <laughs> Like everybody gets bent out of shape out of snow melt, but that's not the problem. It's all that glass buildings. That's where the where the problems are. So stop looking at snow melt systems and turn your eyes to where the real problems are. You know, we had a snow melt system in lower downtown Denver that was on the uh, district steam heating system, which, by the way, is the oldest continuous operating steam district heating system in the United States. And uh, we were utilizing the condensate 
that was coming out of this building. It was all steamed to hot water heat within the building itself. We used the hot condensate as our heat source for the snowmelt system for the ramps on this parking garage, and they never had to fire their auxiliary system. So there are many potential applications of waste heat recovery there that you can do that. Uh, there was also yeah. a facility up in Aspen, Colorado, that used their snowmelt system as the cooling system for this commercial building. So it's a matter of thinking outside of the box. We've got the technology. It's just a matter of application and having people like John and Robert that know how to take these bulls by the horn and design the necessary heat exchangers and pumps and pipes and put them together and say, there you go. You can now use waste heat to be able to melt your snow. You can also produce heat. Mm. I mean, if you wanted to get really crazy, you could cool a snow melt slab down to the point where you could actually produce water. I wouldn't recommend it, but if you wanted to, you could. You could condense whatever moisture was in the air. Uh, I think you're going to find that the slab stability is going to be pretty substantial, which means that you're going to have a significantly longer life expectancy for that concrete material in the long run because you're not going from 50 degrees to 120 degrees back down to 50 degrees. You're maintaining that thing at 70 degrees all the time. We can do it. We have the technology. Well, that's about all the time we had today. Was there anything else um, in general about radiant hydronics and current trends that anyone wanted to add? All right, well, I guess we're, we're all set. Thank you <laughs> all again for taking the time to share your experience with our listeners. We're very lucky to have you. We appreciate the opportunity. And in case somebody happened to miss it, pretty much everybody with the exception of Nicole that's in this picture are all Carlson Hollihan Industry Award of Excellence yeah, right. producers. And <laughs> Thank you all. Sorry I missed the last round. I was stuck in Hawaii celebrating my wife's retirement. Oh, that sounds oh, terrible. Somebody, somebody <laughs> I, can't believe you gave, I can't you believe you gave up the ceremony to be in Hawaii. I just... It's terrible. <laughs> That's shameful. But for That's what it's worth, bad. I ended up in Las Vegas for the award transfer by myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank you. Job, Good to be with you all. Good to see you all. Okay. Stay well. <laughs>